Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, Conditions in Crisis, Conserving Shards, Race, and Chimera. I'm Lucia Guy, the co-founder and the managing director of the Institute of Animal Law of Asia, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Institute of Animal Law of Asia, or ILA, is the educational research center that focuses on animal law issues in Asia and the world. At the ILA, we provide research projects which include animal law in Asian countries on topic, on category, and on species animal law articles. This year, we have launched two projects which are enhancing legal regulations for aquatic animals in Kazakhstan and farmed animal welfare in mainland China. These projects are sponsored and supported by the Center for Animal Law Studies Lewis and Clark Law School. Uh, we also have our own news source, Asia Animal Law Bulletin, which covers the latest updates of animals in Asian countries and regions. Last year, we have launched the Alliance for Animal Law of Asia, which is the international networking campaign that aims to cooperate with national, regional, and global organizations and aims to improve the awareness of animal protection in respective regions. You can support our work by donating or sharing our website and materials. Not too long ago, we have launched our own shop where you can find one of our research projects on farmed animals, wildlife, companion animals, aquatic animals, or any other research project, and also fund one of our animal law webinars or translation services. Um, this year, we have held and organized quite a few webinars. You can check them out um, on our YouTube channel, which is Institute of Animal Law of Asia or go to our website, ilasia.org slash events and see all our past webinars. You can find us on social media, iAnimalAsia on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn, and check out our website, ilasia.org. Today's webinar is organized under the project I'm leading, Enhancing Legal Regulations for Aquatic Animals in Kazakhstan, within the Global Ambassador Program launched by the Center for Animal Law Studies, Lewis and Clark Law School. This wouldn't have been possible without the Cal support. Um, our guest today is Erica Tetra, professor of law at the University of Western Australia. She specializes in international and comparative environmental law with a particular focus on Indo-Pacific Oceans governance. She is the co-author of International Law of Sharks and um, co-editor of Sharks, Conservation Governance and Management. We'll be answering questions after the presentation, so please leave your questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'm personally so honored to have Erica today with us because uh, last year I graduated with my L animal law LLM degree and my LLM thesis was focused on the failure of international law to protect sharks. And I've been citing Erica's books um, throughout my thesis. Uh, so thank you so much for being with us today, Erica. And uh, we look forward, and I, I personally look forward to learning even more from you. Thank you uh, very much, Lucia Gay, for that lovely introduction. And thank you also to the Institute for inviting me to speak on my very favorite topic, which is the protection of sharks. So I have a PowerPoint uh, presentation, which I would like to share with you. And hopefully you can see that on your screens now. So here's a lovely picture. This is, this is where I am today. It doesn't look quite this, this nice today because it's very cold and, and it's been very wet. But this is the University of Western Australia looking across at the city of Perth. Um, so we're very fortunate here to be on the edge of the river. And I've chosen this topic today because I think that sharks still do not receive the level of attention that they deserve in the broader field of environmental law, animal law, and wildlife law. And uh, me and my colleague, uh, Natalie Klein, who I've written the, the books with that um, Lou just mentioned, um, she and I were some of the first uh, lawyers in universities, legal academics, to be working on shark conservation and management. So I've been working in this area for about 10 years. So all I want to do today is to just give you an overview of uh, a little bit about chondrichthians, the bigger group that includes shark, rays, and chimera, uh, a little bit about some of the it, what reasons why we might protect them, what are the impacts, what are the, what's their current conservation status, and then look at the law, both a little bit about international law and also about national law. 
So you can see on the first slide here, uh, this is what I'm going to go through, um, as I've said, and what I really want to look at is sort of this bigger picture. Today, in the time I've got, I can't look at the detail of individual laws, but I want us to think about the bigger picture. So let's start off by thinking about chondrichthians. As I said, this is a, a group that includes over a thousand species, over 1100 species. These, some of these species are ancient. They first evolved more than 400 uh, million years ago. Um, we, could, we found uh, shark teeth um, of different species uh, that are many years old. So they've been around for a really, really long time, far, far longer than uh, human beings. Um, but there's great diversity. And so although there's so many species, if you were to ask somebody how many different shark species they could name, some people could, most people could name one or two, maybe 10, possibly even 20 species, but nobody you know, that I know could seriously start to list all of the species that exist. So when we think about sharks, we tend to think about the large predators, the top predators like the great white. Uh, this is a very large shark. It's uh, at the top of the food chain, eats a lot of species further down the food chain. But we need to remember that some of the species are tiny, maybe just as big as my hand, and we may never see them because they live in benthic on the seafloor um, in remote areas. And although great whites, sharks like that, are predators and they, they eat other species which are not much smaller than them, there are other uh, types of sharks, for example, and you can see at the bottom of the picture there, the whale shark. This is a filter feeder. It's like a whale, it eats tiny, tiny uh, plankton and, and sucks them through its system. It poses no danger uh, to any large species, uh, whether that's us or, or other marine species. So we need to just remember that, that I will be talking today about some of the most well-known sharks, but the range of different animals in this group is huge. And we, it's very difficult to make generalizations. But of course, if we're lawyers and we're trying to develop conservation laws or fishery laws, we have to reduce a lot of that scientific knowledge to generalizations. It's not really possible for us to say we're gonna have a different law for one species versus another. We certainly couldn't do that for 1100 uh, different animals. But what we need to think about then is what are the characteristics of these uh, different animals uh, that mean that we need to protect them? And that will shape the kind of laws or conservation uh, management measures that we put in place. So, <coughs> excuse me. So some of the key features, particularly of species like the white shark and even the whale shark, is that they live for quite a long time. In fact, the Greenland shark uh, lives for hundreds of years, at least a couple of hundred, some people say up to 400 years. So these species are long lived. They also mature relatively late, a little bit like humans. So it might be a couple of decades, uh, maybe 20 years before they actually reach an age where they can reproduce. So that's unlike a lot of other fish, for example, because a lot of fish reproduce quite quickly. They're born, they grow to full size, perhaps even within a year and are reproducing that year. But if you've got a species that lives for a very long time and it takes a long time to, uh, before, it, before a female can have baby sharks, it means that there's a lot of years in which that shark uh, needs to be able to be protected in some way or at least not interfered with before it can reach that sexual maturity. And but with a lot of fishing out in the ocean, we could be catching relatively mature species, maybe uh, a 10 year old shark, uh, but it hasn't yet had a chance to reproduce. And that means that we, we're not replenishing the, uh, the fish stocks for the next generation. So these are some of the characteristics. Uh, another important characteristic is that many sharks are highly migratory. They swim over large areas and they could swim through the waters, for example, of several countries. We know that about the white shark, we know that about the whale shark, is that they may travel through 10 or 20 different countries' waters um, in the course of a year. This means that it's, no, it's not satisfactory just for the sharks to be protected or properly managed in one country, they need to be managed in all countries. 
The other thing to remember is this isn't just protection of a species for its own sake, because we might like sharks, or we might want to respect sharks the way we do whales and protect them. It's also important to remember that they provide really important ecosystem services. And obviously some people eat sharks um, and, and that is an ecosystem service. It's providing food for, for us. Uh, and therefore it also you know, provides livelihoods for fishermen. But we also need to think about the whole of the food chain in the ocean. And one of the important roles that the top predator sharks play is that they eat weaker species further down the food chain. If you take out sharks, it means that the species directly beneath them that would have been their food, that species can expand in numbers because it has no predator anymore. And if that species expands in numbers, it can, therefore it will require food and it will have an impact further down the food chain. So for example, if we take sharks, sharks eat rays, stingrays and other types of rays. If we take sharks out of the food chain or too many of them out of the food chain, the ray numbers will increase. And rays eat shellfish, they eat prawns, they eat other species. So if we have a shellfish fishery, if, if people have their livelihood based in shellfish, if we take out sharks, then we'll end up with too many rays and that will damage our food chain further down. And that could damage our livelihoods and could reduce food for us and put the whole marine ecosystem out of balance. So there are a few really important reasons for us uh, to think about chondrichthians and the focus here today is sharks. So what do we know about the status of sharks? So we know that they've been disproportionately impacted by human activities. So the principal activity then is harvesting, catching fish, fishing. And sharks are taken at a far greater proportion uh, than uh, many other species. And also we need to get it into balance in, in our mind. So we tend to think about some of the sharks, the big sharks, the, the great white, or the uh, mako shark, or the tiger shark, some of these sharks. They, they pose a risk to humans. But that risk is minuscule compared to the number of sharks we take out of the ocean every year. So on average, about 12 people are killed by sharks every year. And of course, that's devastating. And, and, and that shouldn't be you know, underplayed. But look at how many sharks we are taking, over 10,000 sharks per hour. So we're disproportionately taking sharks at a far greater rate. And if you think about what I said before about many of these sharks are very slow to mature, to reach sexual maturity, to reproduce, then it's going to be almost impossible for those sharks to maintain their population numbers if they're being taken out of the ocean at that faster rate. So we know that these this shark uh, populations have declined since the 1970s, and I've just got one slide there showing you uh, one set of uh, figures, which is showing you how, much, how many sharks and what percentage of sharks have been removed since the 1970s. And you can see for some species, it's almost 99%. So this is really very, very difficult situation to be in when such a great proportion of the underlying stock of that species have been taken. So what else do we know? We know that some of these sharks are taken uh, deliberately. So they're deliberately harvested. They're targeted for fishing. Often they're targeted for their fins, um, which are used as a, a delic delicacy in China and some other parts of Asia. So in some cases, they're also taken for their meat um, and for their livers and other parts. But in some cases, these sharks are being uh, are deliberately harvested. In other cases, they're accidentally or, or incidentally taken. So many sharks are caught as bycatch. And in terms of bycatch, I mean, you may have a fishery where the, the target could be tuna, for example. And so the fish are fishing boats are out there catching tuna. But because sharks also eat tuna, sharks can be incidentally or accidentally caught. Um, and then they might also be kept uh, for the shark fin because they've already been caught. But even if they're released back into the ocean, often they're dead or they're injured by the time they're released and may not survive. 
So we need to uh, address this issue of bycatch in terms of fishing. But we also need to think about other incidental impacts on sharks. So sharks are impacted by, for example, marine pollution. If we're polluting the ocean, if we have oil spills or we have chemical spills in the ocean, sharks can become damaged by that. Because they are long-lived species and they're eating other uh, fish out in the ocean, if there are chemicals in the water that, are, that, that fish have, have absorbed, then when sharks eat those fish, they will start to uh, affect their system as well. And because sharks have lived for so long, these chemicals can accumulate in their systems um, over a long period of time. But sharks are also impacted by coastal activities. Many sharks come close to shore for breeding or for birthing or nursery grounds for smaller sharks stay close to shore. If we are developing that coastal strip, we are dredging for ports or other infrastructure. If we are cutting down mangroves or removing um, other parts of the marine environment, which those sharks need for their habitat, then they're going to be incidentally affected as well. And lastly, they can be accidentally injured even by people that are trying to um, look at them or trying to uh, view them in, in terms of tourism. So many whale sharks, for example, which are completely docile, and as I said, they're filter feeders, so they pose no risk to humans. People might swim with those whale sharks. If we're touching the whale sharks, if we are flashing uh, camera lights in front of them, this is going to disturb them and it's going to uh, impact upon them. It could disturb their feeding patterns. It could scare them away from a site where they would ordinarily uh, breed, for example. And so they're impacted by our activities, even when we're not actually trying to harvest them or, or kill them in any way. So all of these aspects um, cause problems. And I've got on the next slide just um, an example there of the targeted fishing here. Up to 100 million sharks are caught each year. Um, we know that there are certain types of hooks that more easily catch sharks, and there are different types of hooks, like a circle hook, which make it harder for a type of shark to be caught. So we could swap those types of hooks if we want to reduce um, uh, bycatch, for example. We can use different types of nets as well. And I've got there pollution. It's not just about chemicals and oil, it's also plastic pollution, and we know that that causes significant problems. One of the things I haven't mentioned so far is greenhouse gases. And of course, climate change, but it can impact everybody, including through increased storm events, etc. But here, I think we're particularly talking about acidification and a temperature rise in the ocean, which can again affect their habitats. At the very least, um, a temperature rise could kill coral, which would kill uh, a whole reef structure and then the whole food chain that the shark relies upon um, for its food. So we need to um, uh, think about the bigger picture of, of climate change, as well as these more specific issues. So this is a picture just to remind us, and I'm sure we all know, but just to remind us that we can't just look at how we might protect or conserve and manage sharks um, just by thinking about how we protect animals through animal law or wildlife law. We have to think about all of the activity out in the ocean. And we know that that ocean where the sharks are found, we also have uh, energy production, oil and gas, wind energy. We have shipping, commercial shipping, we have fishing, we have tourism, and we have all these other activities. So even though we might look out at the ocean and it looks pristine and empty, it's a big blue space, it's not, it's a really, really busy space. And so we have to find ways to, to um, manage all those different activities whilst also conserving and managing specific species. So we, we, we tend to protect whales and uh, sea lions and seals, for example, marine mammals. We also protect a lot of amphibians like um, turtles, but we also need to think about these big fish about this area because I think uh, sharks, as I said before, have not received the research attention uh, that other species have. But also, law is not one of those areas where some of the first researchers started to look at the issues. So 
uh, the scientists started looking at the problems and challenges for sharks first. Um, and then we saw lots of different um, uh, disciplines involved. But relatively late, um, lawyers became involved. So I like to think about this big picture of how law can help overcome the challenges that um, I have already mentioned. So obviously law can prohibit really dangerous activities and damaging activities like shark finning. And shark finning, as most of you know, is where the fin is cut off a shark while it's still alive. The fin is kept because that's the, the lucrative um, part of the animal and the rest is thrown away. But without a fin, a shark, sharks can't swim and therefore they die. Plus, of course, it's, it's painful and it's a horrific practice um, that is very much contrary to animal welfare law. So law can pro prohibit those most, uh, most damaging activities. But then it can regulate legitimate activities. So fishing is a legitimate activity, um, but we need to regulate and manage it in a way that causes less damage um, to sharks, including issues like bycatch that I've talked about before. And if we are going to allow sharks to be harvested legally, then we can set limits to that. How many sharks so that we haven't got that 100 million sharks being killed every year. But law isn't just about regulation or stopping things. Law has a really important facilitative role to play to incentivize best practice, to incentivize conservation versus um, harvesting of fish, to protect critical habitats, which um, incidentally help protect sharks and not just sharks, but other species as well. Law can also play an education role. Part of, part of education is having data, having accurate information. So a legal framework can require signage to be displayed for the public, for example, at a, at a fishing, at a harbour or um, a boat ramp where some people might launch their, their small boat or even at a quay where they are fishing. But law can also raise awareness through training, but also um, monitoring as well. So that's collecting data. Law can require data to be supplied so that we get an accurate picture. If we need to know whether 100 million sharks are still being killed every year or less sharks, we need to have that data. So that can be built into a legal framework as well. But law can, one of the, the other aspects of law is that we need to build capacity. We need to make sure that um, legal frameworks are complied with and they're enforced. So if uh, a piece of legislation, for example, requires um, fisheries officers to monitor something, then a government has to dedicate those resources and build the capacity to actually enforce the law as well. So I find this area really fascinating. As um, Lou said, I've, I've worked on these two books with my colleague, Natalie Klein. Um, and it's very interesting because we've been able to work both, we're both lawyers, so we've been able to work on purely the legal issues, but we've also worked with a lot of other disciplines, scientists, political scientists, um, cultural studies specialists, economists, etc. And I'll come back to the multidisciplinary aspect um, at the end. So a couple of things for us to know about law then. So in terms of protecting sharks, we need law at all levels. We need international law, which is treaties between countries, particularly because I said before that sharks travel through um, the waters of different countries. There's no point one country having brilliant law and another country having no law. We need, to, we need to harmonize those. International law can set those standards. But we need national legislation because it's national legislation that affects us, um, that, that they're the rules by which we as individual citizens in our own countries have to abide. But also we need subnational legislation as well because local areas are often really important for sharks. As I said before, if they're a breeding ground or a nursery ground, that's very much at the local level. So we need all these scales of governance, if you like. But we also need to think about these different sectors. We need to make sure that we haven't just got shark conservation in its own little silo. We need to link to fishing, we need to link to shipping, we need to link to tourism. All these different sectors, you need them working collaboratively and not against each other. Otherwise, we will uh, not achieve outcomes. And even within law, we need to look at different fields. So I'm principally an environmental lawyer, uh, or uh, I look at uh, wildlife law, 
but we also need animal welfare law because of some of the cruelty aspects I spoke about in terms of finning. But we also need natural resources law because that's about harvesting, in this case, fishing. So we need these different fields of law. So this makes it really complex. We've got these different hierarchical scales, but we've also got these horizontal um, areas as well that we need to think about. So how can we put all of this together? So I've given an example here. Of course, we could pass targeted shark laws, laws that just focus purely on sharks, but not many countries have those. Um, and there is no shark treaty at the international level. So although that might be a perfect solution, what we end up with is all these other pieces of the puzzle. We end up with marine, protect, marine park laws or marine protected area laws, um, which means that we can protect specific sites like coral reefs or other areas uh, where sharks uh, might uh, live or they might breed or they might uh, have nursery grounds, for example. We need endangered species legislation for those specific sharks, rays, chimera that are already endangered. We know that they're being targeted. We know that their numbers are so depleted, they need special measures for them. We need fisheries laws, fisheries laws for um, legal harvesting of uh, certain shark species that might be consumed, but also fisheries laws that ban the harvesting of other species. We need environmental protection laws to protect that coastal strip, to look at planning and other issues. Tourism legislation to regulate what we can do when we're in the water trying to engage with sharks. Animal welfare laws. Human safety regulations are important too. So what do we do when we do have shark attacks? Uh, how do we protect people? And of course, there's lots of other areas as well. Shipping, law, trading. Are you legally allowed to sell shark fins? Are you allowed to possess them? Um, and uh, how can we protect the marine environment more broadly, which will stop sharks from suffering pollution, for example. So if we look at the international level, this is a very complicated area. So we have the law of the sea that most of you will be familiar with. Um, and the law of the sea um, focuses on initially uh, creating very broad obligations for nations. All nations have the obligation to um, protect and preserve the marine environment, for example. Uh, it also sets the zones. So we have the first 12 nautical miles off the coast is the territorial sea. That's completely controlled by the coastal state. And then we have from 12 to 200 nautical miles, the exclusive economic zone, where um, sharks and other species can be exploited by the coastal state. But the coastal state also has the obligation to conserve and manage those species. So these are really broad general obligations. But in terms of biodiversity, biodiversity conservation, wildlife law, we have the Convention on Biological Diversity. Again, sets a really important goals of seeking to balance the conservation and the use of species. So it doesn't say we can't ever catch sharks. It just says you, you must balance their long-term conservation with, with that harvesting, with that use. But we also have a couple of other important treaties, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. So this was a treaty passed um, in the 1970s to try and stop trading in species that, uh, that their numbers were plummeting like tigers or lions or elephant ivory. But there are a number of shark species also listed there. And that means that you can't export from one country and import into another country or without, um, uh, meeting the regulatory obligations under that treaty. But there's only a handful of species listed under the under CITES, that, that's the short the acronym is CITES, um, and it only affects international trade, not the sale or trade within our country. But still, it's an important treaty. And then we have the Convention on Migratory Species. So this is about the states, the range states, the states through which the species might move, getting together and adopting an agreement to conserve and manage the species that move through their waters. So these are really important treaties because they set conservation goals. But we also have fisheries agreements. And these um, really are in relation to the high seas, the area that's outside the control of any one state. So the regional fishery management organizations set catch limits, they set quotas. But they also have set some really important rules like um, making it illegal to 
fin, uh, take a fin off a shark while they're alive, requiring that if you are legally going to catch sharks, you must bring them back to port with the fins naturally attached to the shark. And this is kind of important because if you're requiring that you bring the whole shark back to port, you achieve two goals. One, you stop the um, killing of sharks by um, the inhumane practice of, of finning them when they're alive, but you also limit the amount of sharks that can be brought back. Because just imagine you've got a cargo hold in a fishing vessel. If you were just cutting off the fin and packing that in the vessel, you can bring back hundreds of thousands of fins. But if you've got to bring back the whole shark, there's a limit to the number of, of fins you can bring back because you just have to pack the whole space uh, with f the whole body of the shark. So that's one of the things the regional fishery management organizations have done. And then we also have the port state measures agreement, which is about making sure that the port state, which might be different to the state in whose waters the shark was caught, or it might be different from the state where the vessel is registered or where the, the, where the crew come from, that the port state can inspect a vessel and check that the law is being um, complied with. We also have some habitat treaties that would allow us to protect shark habitats like coral reefs, inshore waters, these nursery grounds, these critical habitats with the World Heritage Convention. But we also have the Ramsar Convention, which is a wetland convention, but under Ramsar, uh, wetland it can be extended out from the coast to a depth of five meters. So those shallow waters where sharks might breed or give birth or might be nursery grounds. So that's important. The only real gap at the international level is tourism laws. We have no international uh, treaty on tourism, on best practice tourism, uh, not on any type of tourism uh, and certainly nothing on marine protected, sorry, marine based tourism. So it's a little bit of a gap at the international level. But of course, different countries are free to sign up to these treaties and adopt them whenever they want. And uh, they don't have to, they're not forced to adopt any one convention. So different countries, their different national priorities will cause them uh, to ratify different treaties. So on the next slide, I've just given you a little bit of a sample for some research that I've done on uh, the Indo-Pacific, which includes some uh, Asian jurisdictions like Sri Lanka, um, and the Maldives. So this just shows you here, are these, the, the first one cited is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species. You can see most countries have ratified that, but not all of them. Then you can see the Convention on Migratory Species, and you can see less countries have ratified that. And then you can see under CMS, under the Convention on Migratory Species, there is a particular uh, memorandum of understanding on sharks. So this is a targeted agreement, but it's not legally binding, but it encourages countries to adopt um, further protections for sharks. And you can see there out of all these countries that I've researched, only four have signed that, that MOU. On the end, I've, I've put the International Plan of Action on Sharks. So this is not legally binding. So CITES and CMS are legal treaties, meaning countries bound by them, but the FAO IPOA is not legally binding. But you can see every country, almost every country, has um, got a, either a regional plan of action or a national plan of action on sharks. So it's not as if countries aren't doing anything, but in many cases, what they, what they have adopted, the measures are policy. They are not uh, law. And so that comes back to how enforceable they might be. So we've got this international law, but of course, at the end of the day, um, uh, states have to go back to their own jurisdictions and pass laws to make those, that, those international obligations legally binding on you and me. Um, a country might have a, an international law obligation, but only you and I, we are only bound by national law. So the different ways in which um, countries have done that, they, they might adopt a ban on finning in their own country. They might have a ban on uh, selling or possessing shark fins. They'll have fisheries regulations, etc. All of those areas I've already talked about. And so I looked at the same countries that um, I just uh, referred to before on international law. And I looked at what laws had been used by these different countries. So this isn't all the law. This is pretty much the law that 
focuses on creating marine parks. But you can see, the, you don't need to read all of this, but the important thing here is look at the diversity of laws that have been used. So in the Cook Islands, you can see a Marine Resources Act. But look at Kiribati, Marshall Islands, Nauru, they've all used a Fishery Act as the principal way in which they want to protect um, areas for sharks. But if you look at somewhere like um, Mauritius, you can see they've got a wildlife and national parks law. Um, if you look at Seychelles, they've used a wild animal and a bird protection act, so more of a species-based act. Um, you can see different regulations, different approaches being used in different jurisdictions. And this is really important because in many cases, if you wanted to completely protect all aspects of sharks' lives um, and all of the risks, um, just going back a minute, you'd need all of these laws. You'd need all these different types of laws. And in many countries, there are multiple pieces of legislation that are used. Some pieces of legislation to regulate fishing, others to maybe stop uh, finning, and then others to create protected areas for sharks. But at the end of the day, this is a matter for individual countries. So it's really um, interesting, I think, to see what the priorities are for different countries. So if you're a country that has a big fishing fleet and you make uh, quite, a, uh, it's quite a significant contribution to economy is fishing, then you might choose to address this issue of impacts on sharks through fishing law, fisheries law. But if you don't have a, a fishing fleet and you just want to protect um, these species in terms of uh, an endangered um, or threatened species, then you might use a wildlife law. So if you think of a country like Kazakhstan that, that is landlocked, um, it may not have a large fishing fleet. So it might not have fisheries regulations that are suitable, but they might want to stop shark fins coming into the country. They might want to stop them being imported. They might want to, to stop people from uh, buying or want to remove a market for shark fins which case you will use a different type of legislation. You might use um, an international trade legislation like Papua New Guinea has. You might use a, a particular Wild Animals Act like Seychelles has. So this is up to different countries to do. So there's no right or wrong way to protect uh, and manage sharks in, in a particular jurisdiction. But it's really important to know what all the laws are out, out there and create like a toolbox of legal options from which countries can choose. So we know that we have all of this type of, of law. Nevertheless, there are a number of remaining challenges. Despite all the law that we have, we know the shark numbers are still going down. And this is a problem because this really means that we've failed as lawyers if we're not achieving an outcome. If the outcome of the law is to, to conserve numbers of sharks and we're not achieving that goal, then the law isn't doing its job. So we need to find ways to, to um, amend that law or to strengthen that law so that it achieves its outcome. We also know that there are some gaps. I referred to tourism law at the international level. Some countries have marine-based tourism law, but like Australia does, but uh, not. Uh, there's no sort of guiding, overarching global standard at the international level. So that's, that's one gap. And if you looked at any one country, you might find different gaps. So shark finning, like banning shark finning, um, those laws exist in some jurisdictions. The US, uh, Palau, for example, might ban finning. Palau uses a marine protected area law, might have less laws in, in another area. So we need to look at where the gaps might lie. But I think the real issue now is that we, we do have quite a lot of law. The lack of law is not, I think, really the problem. I think there's two issues. One is enforcement. So we can't allow illegal fishing to take place or illegal trade um, we need to, prop in order to properly manage an issue, it all needs to be within that legal system. So we can manage how many sharks are harvested so that we don't harvest too many. If we know how many are being harvested in total and what the maximum is that um, would be sustainable. But if all of this illegal fishing is taking place and there's a black market, then how do we really know how bad the problem is? And then the other side to that, of course, is enforcement is only one thing. Countries, it's very difficult to um, enforce law out in the ocean because it's a big ocean and most countries don't have resources to constantly police the ocean. Um, so we need to encourage compliance. 
we need to find ways to encourage fishing companies, individual fishing, fishers, people like you and I. We need to find, find ways to make and assist us to comply with the law. And most people comply with the law if they understand and respect that law. They understand what the problem is. Like we, most of us would wear seatbelts in the car, not because the police are going to uh, stop us and fine us for not wearing a seatbelt, but would wear seatbelts because we know it's really dangerous to be driving around without a seatbelt and, and we're at risk. So we're complying with the law because we understand it and we respect it. So comes back to that issue of, of uh, raising awareness, of education, of having accurate data that people believe and is legitimate data, and also making sure that law doesn't offend some of our cultural values. So we, if you have a cultural practice and you've always eaten shark, um, in, in particularly some, some small states, then or local communities, then, then we need to find a way to explain um, why we can't do that anymore, or to give a little exemption for a small amount of a take, which is uh, in exchange for compliance for the majority of the year, for example. So that way you're respecting a cultural value as well. So again, we need to be really mindful of these different issues. And that brings me to my last point, and that is that law is only part of the solution. Clearly, uh, if we are to address these issues uh, for sharks, we need science. We need new knowledge from scientists, constant updates about data, different species. We still, out of those 1,100 species of chondrichthians, we still don't have data on many of them. We need that research done. We've also got technology that we can now use, particularly for issues like monitoring the number of species and to address illegal fishing. There's a little image there on the right of Global Fishing Watch image that they, they track different fishing vessels and can see where they're moving in, in different jurisdictions. So you can, you could, if you wanted, monitor from a satellite or from a drone uh, whether a fishing vessel is going into a protected area where no one's supposed to be fishing. So, but we need to use this technology to better um, ensure compliance and enforcement of the law. We also need to the, the involvement of ec economists as well, because uh, many people will fish and they'll catch sharks because it's, it's beneficial financially for them to do so, or because they have no other livelihood option. People don't have options to provide food for their family or money for their family, then they're going to uh, break the law if, if that's the only choice they have. So we need business, trade, finance, economic specialists as well. But we also need the social scientists um, in other areas like uh, we need to understand geopolitics, we need to understand the cultural influences I just talked about. What are the different cultural values between countries? And we can't design a law in one country and automatically copy it for another country because that cultural uh, foundation is different. The legal system is different, the political system is different, and that cultural environment is different. And that includes doing research on, for example, criminology. Why do criminals break the law? What are the drivers of crime? And so we need to do that research as well. So I love this area because um, it, it, I can find a lot of different legal issues to address, but I'm really mindful the law is just a tiny piece of the puzzle and we need all these different areas. So just in summary then, well, I, I've said these species are ancient species. They've been here for a very long time. They have survived eons, but now they are being disproportionately removed by people, by humans, either directly or indirectly. We know that law may only be one piece of the puzzle, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. It can create those binding rules um, and it can incentivize better practice. I've shown you that we need all different levels of law from international right down to local and we need to address the multiple sectors that have an impact on sharks. But in terms of the work I do, I look, like to look at different countries, uh, look at the laws they've got, uh, compare them to other nations, as I've shown you on the tables, and see if I can come out with a toolbox of different ways in which the conservation and management of sharks can be improved. Not to suggest to any one country what they should do, but to give them the options of the different ways in which other jurisdictions have tried to address this issue and from which 
if you are a country or you're an environmental legal officer in one country, how you might start to approach that problem in your own country. And finally, that it's not all about law, although I think law is very important. It's just one little piece of the puzzle and we need to engage with other disciplines as well. So that's my really quick run through of shark uh, conservation and management um, and the legal approach to that. And I hope that's helpful. and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for this very informative presentation. <laughs> Uh, if you're more interested in sharks protection, international protection of sharks, you can um, read Erica's books and uh, we can shoot to questions now. So our first question is, hi, Professor, is there any other words referring to convergence for the public to understand more easily? Is, is it a better way to include other species other than shark to the shark protection? Oh, you muted yourself. <laughs> so chondrichthyans, sorry, is a, is a scientific term. I didn't make that term up. And it includes sharks, rays, and chimera. So they're three different uh, groups. Um, so is there an easier way? Or oh, I think we just refer to sharks um, if you're just talking about sharks. Um, but, and that's really what I focused on today. Um, but there's no easier way to refer to them because that's the scientific term and, and we need to address that scientific issue. Um, so next question is, most of the time shark finning practice is considered racism towards Asian countries. What's your thoughts on that? Um, I, I, I'm interested that someone said most of the time. I'm not sure um, I would say that's most of the time. There are practices in different countries that are not sustainable. So if you look at the Pacific, for example, historically, th those people, and, and including in Australia, some of the indigenous people would have caught turtles. And we don't allow that anymore. Um, or we reduce the number of turtles that can be caught because we know that sh turtles are being disproportionately um, removed from the ocean as well, or they were for a while. So I don't think it's about racism, it's about understanding different cultural practices. We can respect those practices, but we also have to accept the science that we can't all continue to do those things unchecked. I mean, historically, people used to shoot rhinos and shoot elephants and take the elephant ivory, and we don't allow that anymore because there's, that's, that's, there's not, there won't be any elephants or rhinos left if we do that. So this is just another example. So this sharks and shark fins maybe is directed a little bit more towards Asia, but then the elephant hunting was in Africa. So it's just another example. I don't, I think it's just a function of reality that the shark fins are considered valuable in Asia. And so it's, it, that's, it, I don't think it's directed any more at that continent, except that that's the market and we have to address that market and we can't keep um, harvesting species, but that would go for all species. Perhaps we shouldn't be eating as much tuna and that is something for the whole world to think about. Um, so it's, it's really about the cultural practice and understanding the cultural practice, respecting it, but also explaining that we can't continue at the levels we have done in the past. Um, sharks are always illustrated and demonstrated as dangerous creatures. How to persuade the, pub the public that our oceans need sharks and they keep our oceans healthy, thus we humans need them? Well, I think it's, um, this, it's about giving lectures like this and giving public lectures, and I give quite a few public lectures, um, and as do many scientists. When you explain there might be 1,100 species or at least 600 species of sharks, but uh, only three have ever been implicated in, in a human death. There's only three species out of hundreds and hundreds. So what about all those other species? And then also, I mean, I think I've tried to communicate that today by showing sharks only kill 12 people a year and we kill 100 million sharks a year. Now, I understand that that's terrible. Obviously, you know, I respect the fact that 12 people who were killed, that, that's a terrible situation, but we need to put it in perspective. Um, and we need to look at all the other things. I mean, bees kill more people, snakes kill more people, crocodiles kill more people than sharks every year. So we need to just get the bigger picture and, and try and put things in perspective 
and communicate that to the public so that they understand. You mentioned some crazy statistics with shark killing per year and even per hour. Do you believe in sustainable fishing? Um, do you think we should stop fishing at all? Oh, oh, of course I believe in sustainable fishing or I wouldn't do the work that I do. Um, as I said before, uh, no, I don't think we should stop fishing. I think we need to understand the science. So let's put it in simplistic terms. If we, if we take a thousand of one species, of, let's say a thousand tuna, if we take a thousand tuna out of the ocean every year and we're fishing, but they only reproduce at a rate where they can replenish those stocks at 200 tuna a year, well then ultimately you're just gonna keep reducing the number of tuna in the ocean. The same with sharks. So we need to understand what the different reproductive rates of different species, and that's a lot of science. You need to, to understand the science in different parts of the world for different species and understand the rate at which they can reproduce. Then you can set the limit. And so under the Convention on the Law of the Sea, it says that you must look at the total allowable catch based on the maximum sustainable yield maximum sustainable yield. So if, if, if sharks reproduce at, you know, a thousand a year, then you can take a thousand out a year because then you're maintaining the sustainability. But if you're taking out 10,000, then that's unsustainable. So I think we need to better understand the science. The science needs to be communicated to the law and policy makers. And then we need laws that respect that science. And then we need to enforce those laws. And the difficulty, of course, is that if we if we are only counting legal shark catch, and then we have all this illegal activity, 30% extra or whatever it is over here, then, then obviously we're not going to be effective because we're still catching too many shark if you add the legal and the illegal. So we've got to try and reduce illegal fishing. We've got to try and better understand the science. We've got to embed that in law and policy and enforce it. So that's what we need to do if we're going to be sustainable about fishing. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation, Professor. What is the most effective way to raise awareness about the need to protect sharks? I don't think there's any one particular way. I think we can do it in different ways. We can do it through formal education in schools or talking to younger people. We can do it through universities like I'm doing, and I include a case study in my course on environmental law. We can give public lectures, we can uh, raise awareness in restaurants and in, in different countries in the world, for example, you might have uh, information given by the government on this is more a more sustainable choice, this is a less sustainable choice. And just remember that we changed the whole attitude towards whales. You know, in, in the last century, we were catching whales everywhere in the world. We, there was, well, Australia was a big whaling nation and then by the 1970s, we changed and we became wanting to conserve whales. So we can change attitudes through education and, and raising awareness. But I don't think there's any one way. We can do it through social media. We can do it through television documentaries by David Attenborough and other wonderful people. We can do it through books and, and talking to each other and just sharing statistics with other colleagues. Yeah, I totally agree. I think education is the one of the most powerful tools to raise awareness. Um, we have a few questions left. So the next que the que question is, from my aspect, uh, industrial pollution is harming more sharks, such as energy plants and oil facilities. What is your opinion towards this issue? Do you think this is not that important? Um, well, if you have oil spills, I, I don't think energy production in itself is polluting. Um, we, we, you, you can have an oil rig um, which doesn't leak oil <laughs> into the ocean. It doesn't pollute the ocean environment. So we need tighter regulations of the energy industry to make sure it doesn't pollute the ocean because polluting the ocean isn't just about sharks. Um, there are fish we eat that will be consuming oil if we have an oil spill. Um, and sh same as shipping disasters as well. So. I think that they are very important issues. And I think we, again, we have a lot of law in that area, but I don't think energy production is, is necessarily polluting. Um, of, of we have uh, coal-fired power stations, which cause greenhouse gases, um, which affect climate change as well. But we just need to make those less polluting. Um, 
because they don't, we don't really need uh, to have polluting industries at all. And in many cases, we have been very, very successful. Probably sh pollution from ships is one of the best examples where, you know, 40 years ago, we had large quantities of oil from shipwrecks, uh, damage to, to oil tankers, and now a tiny fraction of the pollution um, in the ocean comes from oil uh, shipping disasters because we've tightened the law, we've improved ship design, we've got better regulations. So we just need to keep improving those laws. Um, are sharks well protected in Tasmania, in Australia particularly? Many landlocked countries don't do shark fishing, but keep sharks in aquariums and aquariums. How, how do we prevent catching sharks and putting them in tanks? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on Tasmanian law, so I'm in a different state of, of Australia. I'm in Western Australia, so um, I can't speak about uh, Tasmanian law at all. Um, it's not my area. Uh, Australia has fishing regulations. Australia has protected certain species. It's signed the treaties I talked about today. So we protect the great white shark, we protect whale sharks, etc. Um, we also have marine protected areas which are important for sharks. Um, we also we have all, all kinds of laws. We have marine based tourism laws um, in Australia too. So Australia has got a lot of law in this area. Um, the second part of the question was about uh what sorry i can't remember um oh so about keep um catching and putting sharks into aquariums and aquariums so yeah so that's remember. another that's another area of law right so the aquarium of protecting species from being put in an aquarium um there are certain sharks you can't keep in an aquarium uh in australia and elsewhere because they're too big they need really large areas and you're not allowed to do that um, but as I said, there's great diversity in species. So there are little species. Sometimes we do keep them in an aquaria. Um, and sometimes you're allowed to do that for a period of time and then release them again. So that's an important area of law as well. Um, and one that we do need good regulation. And again, we need to look at the best practice laws in the world um, that embed the science. And then that's a really good model, it becomes a good model for other jurisdictions as well. Um, conservationists don't care about animal welfare for sharks or even wildlife. How to convince them into the idea that the wildlife's welfare is also needed to be taken into consideration? Oh, well, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I consider myself to be an environmental conservation <laughs> academic and I care about the welfare. Um, I th I'm not sure I agree. So I don't think, I, I don't think they're the people you need to convince. Um, I think conservationists do care about animal welfare. Uh, I think it's more the case that if your job is to, you make your money, your livelihood from fishing, for example, you may not care as much about welfare because your, your priorities are completely different. Um, but we, again, this is an area where we've changed thinking. Uh, the science now shows that fish, including sharks, can feel pain. And many people um, are now looking at how we can embed that in different laws. Uh, but we, again, you can see that with farmed food like chickens and free range chickens versus battery uh, hens and other animals. So I think there is an important intersection between animal welfare law and conservation law, and they don't always link together. But I said that uh, at the beginning, I think this animal welfare law is an important piece of the puzzle. And I think actually the shark finning issue has brought these two areas together. So conservationists might want to protect the shark from shark finning because they want to keep the sharks alive. Animal welfare people might just dislike the cruelty of the practice of cutting a live fin off a, sh a shark, a fin off a live shark. Um, but that's an issue where they can come together. So we need to find those areas where the two, uh, the intersection of, of two different areas of law and, and to strengthen the, the, the laws in each area to make sure that they together um, have a multiplicative effect and protect, better protect sharks. Um, and we have the last question. Many people do not value humans and animals together. They think 12 human lives are far more important than shark lives, no matter how many sharks are killed. How to have the conversation with them? Well, I think all you can do is have the conversation. Um, 
I agree with you that many people do think uh, human lives are more important. And of course, if it was your mother or brother or husband or wife, and you, you would have that view too. Um, and so we just need to put it in perspective. One of the issues I like to try and explain to people when I'm giving lectures is look at how many humans kill other humans. Look at the risk factors from our own species. Okay, so we need to, to look at all risks in different ways. So of course, of course, um, human lives are very important, but no one is threatening human populations that we will not, there won't be any of us left. Of course, our, our population numbers are still going up. And so I would try and explain it to people in terms of having a conversation around, do we have the right to reduce populations of other species till they become extinct? We need to try and think about these different issues. And of course, people have different views and different values and different philosophies, but surely one of the better aspects of human nature is that we can have these conversations. We can reason, we can discuss, we can debate. And so I hope that by doing that, uh, having the conversation, we can uh, have respect on both sides for both the different views. But in many cases, the sharks that we are killing, 100 million sharks a year, they're not sharks that can ever hurt humans. So there are hundreds of species that are being taken out in the ocean, which are not a threat to us ever. So we need to think about what right we have to uh, take those species at unsustainable levels, which we, when they pose absolutely no threat to us. Okay, um, thank you for answering this question. And that's it for questions. Thank you again for speaking for us today. And I was so honored to have you today with us. And um, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel and we will announce it on our social media and publish it on our website. So please uh, follow us on social media and uh, thank you for being part of my project. It's very important that you raise awareness by giving such lectures and um, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. Thank you. <laughs>